Um, announcements for now, we just, uh, we just go right into our message. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a second so that we can use 1 John 1, nine. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for today, especially because we get to recognize our moms. We realize, Lord, that if it were not for the moms, we would not be here today. And so we pray, dear God, that as we continue with our message from last week, that we would find these principles, we would look at these principles and make application, we would make adjustments so that whether we are a mom, a dad, a son or a daughter, we would be able to do these things so that ultimately we would be pleasing before you. I thank you, Father, for this time. And if anything's vying for our attention, I pray that we would just lay those aside for the moment so that we can focus on thee and focus on thy word. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, last week I started with... Uh, Philippians 1.27. This is actually the title. It's from Philippians 1.27. And we should be able to finish this today. We will review just a few slides back. Otherwise, it won't make sense. But we should conclude because I'm also going to uh, skip several slides from last week. So I want you to see this. And I posed it as a question last week as we opened up. It said, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. What are those things that would be worthy of the gospel of Christ? What kind of behavior, what kind of conduct? Because Paul is telling the Philippians here that you ought to let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So prior to salvation, behavior is irrelevant doesn't matter. You're good or bad, you do drugs, you get drunk, you carouse. That has nothing to do with your salvation. We can't, we can't stop them from doing that. And we shouldn't because they don't have the power anyways. But the moment they become a believer in Christ, we get hit with verses like this where we are challenged to ask ourselves, well, is our behavior, is our conduct worthy not of Christ, but the gospel of Christ, the message of Christ. Is our behavior worthy? Is it going to bring praise and glory and honor to God? So prior to conversion, we accept people the way that they are. Why? Because Jesus did. But the moment they cross that line and they pass from death into life, our responsibility is to disciple others, disciple those who we lead to Christ, if possible, and encourage them to get plugged into a local Bible teaching church, Free Grace Church, so that they would continue to get exposed to truth so that in, in time, they're going to be conformed into the likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. They can't do it on their own. And I'm not even sure how many people are aware of this. That there is a sense that your, our conduct and behavior ought to be worthy of the message that we keep proclaiming out there. We have to have our behavior match what we're communicating so that it would be in line with what Paul is raising here in 127. If not, we're already in trouble. 
If it's not worthy of the gospel of Christ, then we should just stay home. We should just live life to ourselves. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but I believe that Paul and others, when you look at the scripture, especially Christ, he wants people that's going to come on board and team up with him to go out there and make disciples. This is serious business. In the Philippines, they're about to elect another president. And some people are willing to, to vote for one particular man, although vulgar and his language is not consistent with what we would say uh, scripture or biblical in, in choice of words, wholesome words, a lot of people are standing behind this guy. Be why? Why are they going to vote for someone like this? I'm not saying that, I'm not in any way suggesting whether or not I would or not. But I want to bring this out because I want you to see that irregardless of one's behavior, if you can give hope to someone and say, if you, put, if you select me, I'll change the world for you. I'm tired of all this stuff. Aren't you guys? So what do you think the people are going to do? I say, oh yeah, I want that guy. Don't listen to his words, but yeah, let, let's, let's vote for him. Because people in their core want change. They're tired of it. And now it doesn't matter how they conduct themselves. Whether it's appropriate or not, people are going and, and willing to pick certain people because they are offering hope for their country. 8th of November, we're going to do the same thing. And what I've been saying for the, for the longest time is we shouldn't just worry about the person in the office a few months before. Hey, who are you going to pick? Who are you going to vote for? If you want a particular person there who lines up with Scripture, it's not praying just for the right person. It's getting the voters to vote for the right person. And how do you think we're going to influence that? You and I have to do the job of communicating the gospel. And whoever gets elected is because that's the majority of what our country is into right now. And you should not be surprised. So if we get someone that you don't like, that's... The, that's the majority of the people in America. And I personally believe we're under discipline. And unless the churches pull together and make an impact and start sharing the gospel and, and taking seriously what God has communicated to us, people are just going to continue to divide and we're going to see chaos and we're going to see sin just continue to go upwards as a way of life. And now people don't know left from right anymore. They don't know right from wrong anymore. Because there's too many noise and distraction. So much so that we don't even hear anything from the word of God. And that's why the churches need to pull together and influence the people around the periphery of of the, those who are a part of this church and the other local churches that are believers in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, don't be upset or discouraged or surprised if we're going through hard times. Do you know that the only way that we could see temporal stability is when we as the pivot would make an impact in our periphery? I'm not saying that it's going to solve the problem, but if people are believers in Christ and they're learning what we're learning, then they're not going to think of themselves only, they're going to think of each other. And where is that originating from? God's Word. See, if we left it, if we opened the, the room up and we just started to share our preferences, likes and dislikes, we're not going to get along because we have different preferences, different likes and dislikes. But the moment we look at the Scriptures together, we have, to bow, we have to bow the knee to that. He's the boss. That's where 
harmony comes in. That's where stability can occur. When those who are believers in Christ who will agree that God is first is first, they'll make application to everything that the Word of God says to the best of their ability. Then and only then will we see harmony and people getting along. Not because we're working together. I pointed out in our Saturday night study, pulling together, a majority of people coming together, that's just going to repeat Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Pulling together and working together does nothing. We need to go back and get into the Word of God. Now, that's not to say that you guys aren't. We've got, a, we've got a global audience right now. We're online. So this is for you and everybody. And if you're consistently doing this, then this doesn't even apply to you because you're faithfully doing what I'm saying. But on the other hand, if you're not, then I want to challenge you into making application to what I'm teaching. We don't want to just hear it and do nothing about it. We want to be doers of the word. Is that, is that fair to say? So let's proceed with Philippians 1.27. Well, that's just the verse. Oops. That's just the verse that I wanted us to look at. We're going to look at four verses, two, Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So let's kind of review this. Therefore, if, any, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, we'll stop there. Do you guys agree that there is? Do you believe that there is some comfort in Christ? Do you believe that there's comfort in His love? Comfort in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Comfort in His affection and mercy? Those are going to be very important to to look at. We'll zoom in on those. There is. And he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. And lastly, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of of others. So let's look at the first word, the word therefore. Again, it goes back to 127, which is what we started with. And here it is again, right in front of you. Only let your conduct, this is all of 27 now, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving or working together for the faith of the gospel. You see that? And that word worthy, axios, worthy, it means honorable, admirable, suitable. Let your conduct be worthy or admirable or suitable or honorable of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's 127. You notice that there's four ifs. If, 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 if. If there's any consolation, there is. If there's any comfort of love, there is. If any fellowship, there certainly is. Any affection and mercy, yes. So each if deals with a motivation for unity. Paul is dealing with the Philippians. They weren't really getting along. And as I had pointed out last week, there were two particular women who were at odds. So if there is comfort, if there is fellowship, if there is affection and mercy, and we'll see the rest of the verse, the section afterwards. Uh, in each if is an entitlement every believer possesses at the point of salvation. That's ours. We do have consolation or comfort in Christ. We're never alone. What did he say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Is that comforting? He may not physically be in front of you or to your side, 
But in a very real way, he's in you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. He was talking to his disciples originally, but by principle, and because we are disciples, we are believers, that applies to us too. He would never abandon us. There are a lot of people who are committing suicide because they are so lonely. Did you know that? They're lonely. Nobody's there for me. Do you think if we would communicate how God loves them, that he surrendered his son, that by believing in his son they can have everlasting life, and that they, he would never leave them nor forsake them, would that encourage them just a tiny bit? I would think so. But people today, they don't know this because of all the distraction. We're under the sway of the God of this age who is so busy distracting us. He's placed a veil over our eyes. Placed a veil over people's eyes. Unbelievers especially, lest they believe. But in a real sense, he's placed a veil over us in the form of distraction so that we don't get into his word. And when we don't get into his word, we're not able to discern right from wrong, Hebrews 5. But the mature person, that's a, that person we need more of. Why? So that in the midst of all the chaos that's going on in this world, that person, whether it's a male or female, will be able to say, in spite of what's going on, this is what the word of God says. We need to know right from wrong. And a lot of people today do not know right from wrong. So it deals with the motivation for unity. The four ifs in verse 1, I mentioned this last week, all mean since. They are statements of fact. The argument is based on our divine provisions. So since this is true, that we have comfort in Christ, since this is true that we have comfort and love, since this is true that we have fellowship with the Spirit, don't grieve nor quench the Spirit, right? We have that relationship and fellowship and harmony with the Spirit. And we do, since it's true that we receive affection and mercy, the point of salvation. Since these are true, and again, since we're just in here, it's just this motivation that Paul is launching with the objective of Encouraging what? Unity. See, the picture is like this. Remember, how many times have you heard this? We're in this world, but not of this world. Have you heard that before? Yeah. What does it actually mean? We've got each other. We've got maybe believers at work, which is helpful. But outside... There's a totally different mindset. The scripture calls it worldly. Worldly isn't dancing, drinking, smoking. At the core, you know what worldliness is? Keeping God out of the picture. That's the, what the world does. That's what the unregenerate world does. God is not in the picture. So in, the, in the, the core of it all, the world versus the churches, the world is under the influence of the God of this age, and he continues to mastermind and create more distractions to keep everybody busy. And he knows, and he sees, and so do we, that some of our unbelieving friends is influencing us. So that when we don't have enough time to spend time at home, quality time with God. We don't get to go to church on a regular basis. That's going to impact our worldview. That's going to impact how we think. That's going to slow down the Romans 12 too. Where if Romans 12 too is to be taken literally, transformation is constantly going to be the direct result of renewing our minds. So maybe we could, form, we could ask the question, well, how often are we renewing our minds? So if we're in the business of renewing our minds, it doesn't have to take place only at church. But if we're not renewing our minds somehow in the power of God's word, which is alive and powerful, then the things that the world is doing, 
eventually we're going to adopt that as a way of life. You know why? Because of our sin nature. We're no different than them. It's much easier to be an unbeliever. It's much easier to just do without God. We don't have to commit. We don't have to dedicate ourselves to, uh, you know, studying the scriptures on a, on a regular basis. It's easy to just have fun and to do whatever we want to do. We just want to relax and have fun. You know, being a Christian, that's the most fun anybody can have. God had promised us that he gives us a life and life more abundantly. But when we go and get sidetracked and we pursue fun apart from God, you will experience a temporal fun but you will also, more than likely, experience the disciplining hand of God. Michael. I'm just curious because you, when you say we don't include God in the picture, yeah. um, this is just kind of vague for me. And I'm yeah. curious, do you mean, let's say, we're going to go to a party, like a friend's party. Yeah. If we don't include God in the picture, does that mean just being out there having fun for no reason? Or can you just yeah, good question. What does it mean to keep God out of the picture. I mean it in its fullest sense. Where if, I, if we're going to back up and say what is worldliness or what is worldly, it is when God is not a part of their life. Now, how many of us like to go to parties? That's not worldliness. Jesus spent, I think, a week in, in John chapter 2. They had a wedding. And he, in fact, created six kegs. Lord, uh, they're out of wine. Why are you talking to me? He goes, well, they're, they're celebrating and it's, it's going to be embarrassing if they don't have any choice wine. Oh, all right. Fill it up. Fill the, the water pots with water. And they had the best wine. So Jesus knew how to relax and have fun. I'm talking about where God is not number one in your life. There are some that would conduct themselves in that manner. You go to a place, you go to a party, you go somewhere. Oh, wherever you are, you can have God there. But I'm talking about where is he number one in your life? Is he a high priority in your life? Because I'm trying to piggyback off of our message. So please don't misunderstand me. I mean, if you have a party, please invite me. I'd like to go. I enjoy yeah, I gatherings. Sure it was no. Easy yeah. to kind of be distracted saying, hey, what about the things I do, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, and I know that not everybody can make it on a Sunday. And that's not to say that they're, they're not putting God first. So I'm taking the, the word in its general sense according to Scripture. When we talk about worldly, God is not there. Out of a list of things to do, God is not on that list of things to do or to focus in on. I like what, how Paul, um, how he was very bold in what he would say as far as to the local churches. For me to live is Christ. To die, hey, I'm, I'm out of here. It's gain. For me to live, Christ. My life reflects Christ in everything that I do. Not everyone's like that, but I think that's a good goal. To aim to ultimately please Christ. Okay? So, each if deals with a motivation and it means, it's like saying since. If there's any consolation in Christ. So here's the first motivation for unity. There is encouragement in our union. Notice the positional truth there, in Christ. There is encouragement because when God looks down on us, he sees us in who? We're in Christ. We hold the same status quo as Jesus Christ in God's eyes. The believer has a status quo before God that is equivalent to that of Jesus. There is comfort and motivation in that. So this is the first motivation for the Philippians to work out this 
dissension. He's encouraging them to be harmonious. And he wants them to pull together in unity. See, for other believers or brethren, the word affection literally means internal organs, uh, regarded by the first century reader as the cen center of the deepest feelings coming from within. And then that word mercy is the withholding of a just condemnation. When we deserve punishment, he does not punish us. A person who has come to know Christ has the capacity to extend affection and mercy. You know, we're supposed to take care of each other. I, I'm hoping that we're seeing this here. But can someone also turn to Galatians 6.10? We have a special responsibility to the brethren. Did you know that? Who has Galatians 6.10? Okay, Bob, please read it. Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay, so let us do what to what? To who? Let us do good to who? Okay, so we're supposed to do good to people, right? But what else does it say? especially to the household of faith, the brethren, the church. We take care of each other. So if you're good at taking care of those outside of the church, that's good. You're in compliance with Galatians 6.10. How about the second half of the church? Or the second half of the verse? We ought to be thinking out for each other as well, which is good. That's God's way of... Um, providing unity and harmony within the assembly. 
where we can impact the people around us in a positive way, a positive manner. We've heard some people today say that, you know, the moms here are like a mom to them. So we should take care of each other. This is a good thing. And here, at this point, Paul was trying to stabilize the church because they were not doing the four things that we just read. So if we want to duplicate what they were going through, then we have to withhold the affection and mercy, withhold any love towards the brethren, withhold the fact that we are in Christ. And instead of focusing on who we are to motivate us to do the rest of these motivations, we focus in on their flaws and shortcomings. But Paul doesn't want them to do that. And neither should we. I don't believe we are. But again, these are good reminders for all of us. Look at verse 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, and of one mind. So Paul makes his challenge now, and it's to be in harmony from, the, from verse 2 to verse 4. And this challenge is that they would develop four areas of harmony, which, is clearly, which clearly can be seen in this one verse. Notice, like-minded, same love. One accord, one mind. Right? It's loaded in this one verse. So let's look. Notice the very first word, the very first word is fulfill. It means literally to make full or to fill. It came to mean in usage fulfill, perform, complete, or accomplish. The grammar here indicates that the action upon these four motivations of verse 1 should be done decisively. In other words, it's not just going to happen all on its own. You have to make a choice to do these things. It requires your volition. It just doesn't happen on its own. It takes a decisive decision or else we will continue to indulge ourselves in schism. So Paul starts by saying, fulfill. And then we see that uh, we'll see what he wants them to do. Be like-minded. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. The first step to unity is to be what? So if, there's, if there is no harmony among the brethren... The very first thing he wants us to focus in on is our thinking. The first is to be like-minded. Literally, it means to think the same thing. This is unity of attitude. Where minds are in tune, they are one in attitude. So to be like-minded means to have the mind of Christ, to see things as he would see them and to respond as he would respond. And the best way to get these characteristics in, is to study the scripture, to learn about how God views things. It's that, notice the like-minded phroneo means to think objectively, means to comprehend, think things through. Be like-minded. The oneness of attitude comes from knowing Bible doctrine. The closer we are to him, the closer we are to one another. Okay? Next. Fulfill my joy by having the same love. The word having means to go on having, constantly having. To have the same love means to show them the same love to others, show the same love to others that God has shown to us. That's going to be hard if you don't know how God has demonstrated his love towards you. But once you expose yourself to his grace and you understand the depth of his love towards you, it becomes much easier to look at someone else and reciprocate or to extend love 
towards the unlovable. God didn't just love the lovable. In fact, in his mind, there was no lovable people. The scripture says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he has demonstrated to us that he can supply love in an impersonal way so that in time when we respond, it becomes personal. Because we have been loved by God, we ought to love one another. It's another reason why we should love our brethren. Next one is, so having the same love, being of one accord. The phrase literally means co-souled. Soul with soul. There's that oneness with the brother or sister in Christ. Means to work together in harmony towards a common good. And if in a church context, that would be what, what are we doing to win people for Christ? What are we doing to educate the younger people in our church? In our church? How can we contribute to the edification of the brethren? As Ephesians 4 says, the job of the pastor is to equip so that the brethren can do the work of the ministry. That means you guys can do the work of the ministry. As you're drawing from his word, you're learning what makes what, what God uh, desires. He desires that none should perish. So that should be something to take into consideration. If that's true, then what can we do to, to help? It doesn't have to be here at 2 o'clock, but it's nice that when God sees us, whether it, collectively or individually, we're making an impact for Jesus Christ. Right? So we're co-souled, we're working in harmony towards a common goal. Notice what he says next. Of one mind... This means that we are able to think like Christ thinks, to act so unitedly as to show that Christ's mind is directing our activities. He's not talking about, you know, you're supposed to think like me, I'm supposed to think like you. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. And if you think about it, if we have the mind of Christ, then we're going to be consistent we're going to be aiming and accomplishing and doing the same things. Maybe not in the same order. And Paul reminds us, hey, did you know that some of your hands, some of your feet, some of your eyes, if we remove one part of the body, we will still live. But it's hard to do things when one member is severed or affected. If you have a little dust in your eye, isn't it hard to see? Doesn't that slow you down? Doesn't that make you stop whatever it is you're doing? Every part of the body is vital. Every person in here is extremely important. So it's the mind of Christ that should be directing our activities. And by the way, it's not just here. It's not just in Philippians. Look at... Uh, some other passages. There are other passages on this subject. Be of the same mind toward who? One another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Romans 12, 16. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Romans 15, 5. The content of our thinking should be the same as the Lord Jesus Christ because we have his mind. So stability, harmony will come as a result of drawing in and making application to God's word. Otherwise, our differences, our preferences will come out and show. I like Hondas. I like Toyotas. I like the electrical cars. In electric cars... You know, if we sh express our differences, we're, that's going to add. A, that's going to divide us. But the moment we look at the same source and we listen to the same person, there's harmony. 
That's the only person. He's the only person where if we follow him, there's going to be harmony among the followers if we follow what he says. We know that from time to time, the disciples didn't always agree with each other, but that's because they decided to make decisions apart from Christ. And he said, well, you know, you guys are squabbling about who's the greatest in the kingdom. You got to be like this child here. So the moment they took their eyes off each other and they said, like this child? That's when they started to come around again. Then there was harmony. And they did a fantastic job of sharing and impacting the entire world. Because the moment he ascended, 12 men, which turned out to be 11, then one more added later on, impacted the world. And we're still seeing the impact and the consequences to their faithfulness and their steadfastness. Look at verse 3. Two more verses and then we're done. Let nothing be done, whatever it is that we do, through selfish ambition or conceit. But instead, lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So here, Paul argues against two negative attitudes in this phrase. We're going to zoom in on it. First of all, let's note the word through. Let nothing be done through. It's the Greek word kata, according to or corresponding to. Through indicates that believers use these two negative attitudes to attain their goals in the Christian community. What's the first one? Well, the first one that Christians will sometimes do is they'll have what's called selfish ambition. Self selfish ambition is the desire to be number one. There's nothing wrong with being competitive in sports. When we go out to, on the 29th and we play volleyball, I want to be number one. There's nothing wrong with that. He's not talking about, you know, in sports or fun. But when, you're, when we're talking about ambition in life, this can actually affect your relationship with one another. Notice, notice, it's the desire to be number one no matter what the cost. Do we know people like that? Have we read of stories of people who would, at all costs, they will get to the top, even if it means manipulating this person and that person, stepping on them, lying? It means party spirit or faction. This involves intrigue or maybe deception or trickery, by a person who wants to promote his own cause. That's the first thing that we're, we can see. The other one is conceit. So selfish ambition, now the word is conceit. conceit. That word means empty glory. It is parading oneself before others. It means to deck oneself out with a facade that has nothing behind it. This person lives for applause. An ovation from men is more important than the approval of God. This is a person who appropriates to self what actually belongs to God. So let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let nothing be done through conceit. What's next? Well... Instead, lowliness, lowliness of mind, that's the opposite of selfish ambition and conceit. Remember, he's addressing the Philippians here. He's giving instructions on how to bring about stability and harmony. Have lowliness of mind, which is the opposite of those two words, the selfish ambition and conceit. The word mind is attitude. Um, an attitude is more than just thinking. An attitude is a habit of thinking, a frame of reference by which we make value judgments. So this is not self-effacement where you are trying not to make yourself noticeable or not drawing the attention of people. Lowliness of mind is thinking that everything we are is from God. It's the right attitude about things. 
We can never earn the right to hold ourselves above others. Everything we are is from the grace of God. See? In fact, look, just to be clear, Paul brings out the next line. What does he say? Let each esteem others better, better than himself. The word esteem means to lead out before the mind, to regard or count it to be true. We are to count it to be true that others are better than us. The other means to embrace an entirely new attitude toward our fellow believer. Notice that this does not say look for the good qualities in others that may be greater than ours. This is a community where everyone is giving consideration to the other person. We cannot do this on our own strength. Obviously, we're going to be, have to be in harmony with God himself under his direct influence to be able to say, Bob is better than me. It's an attitude. It's where we're giving preference to the person next to us than focusing on self. That might run against the grain of some of us here, right? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a weakness of our sin nature. But this is the solution to bringing about unity. Because if we don't make application to this, then there'll be no unity, lack of harmony, divisions, tension. Now imagine, just think for a moment, what if the person next to you thinks of you more than themselves? Would that upset you? No. That will probably motivate you to want to be their friend even more. And then maybe as you're getting into the word and as you're seeing for yourself what the scripture says, you'll in turn think of them as better than you. What will that do? That'll bring people closer. That's the brilliant idea and solution from God himself. So if there's two people who are not, at, are not talking, that's how you solve it. But it requires the volition of those two parties. Someone has to start. Bob? Is this only applicable to an attitude towards our fellow believer or also unbeliever? Well, the context here is among the brethren. So I think the, the primary use of esteeming others better than himself, it would be more appropriate or more fitting to keep it or contain it within the church context. When, when we're dealing with others, um, as an unbeliever, I can't see Paul saying, well, let the unbeliever, think of the unbeliever better than yourself. See, I think if anything, we've, we've been given some... Uh, instructions to love them but not to think of them better than ourselves because they're at odds with God. We actually have an advantage over them. We are a son and daughter of the Most High. They aren't. So as far as dealing with those who are we're not in harmony with then that would be impersonal love towards the unbelievers. I don't know of any place including here where he will extend it beyond the reach of the brethren. He's dealing with an internal, internal uh, problem within the church. So that's the way I would see it. So good question though. Okay, let's move to verse 4. We're about done now. He closes, or will close, with this. Let's pick apart verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We live in a culture where everyone looks out for himself and the things of others do not concern us. 
Here we are introduced to the opposite value. Look at the word look. Or the first phrase indicates the, valid the validity of looking out for our own interests. So he's not saying that you can't take care of yourself or look out for your own interest. He says, the word look means to mentally consider to regard something as an aim. So it indicates the validity of looking out for your own interest, but it doesn't stop there. So you look out not only for your own interest, well, let me finish this one line here. Own interest is our own point of view. We are not only to consider our own point of view, we are not to look out for our own things only. But, notice, here's what I was looking for. The interest of others. If all of us are looking out for each other, we would call this spiritual reciprocity, the whole will be better than the parts. Instead of disregarding each other's interest, we instead help each other and we deliberately choose the interest of others. That's it. Let's, Saris? Get more on trying to stress more on the interest of others than our own interest. That's right. The interest of others rather than our own interest. He doesn't say you can't have your own interest. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. That's where the problem lies. But look also for the interest of others. So this is the solution to the problem that was going on in the Philippian church. So, great observation. So let me, let me close with several points of observation. There are seven. Number one, because of the four if statements in verse 1, we should be motivated to be like-minded. In Christ, we are comforted by God's love. We have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If this is true, then we should be motivated to be like-minded. We have the capacity to extend affection and mercy. God has extended those to us. Right? So, uh, should we be like-minded? Uh, yeah, why? Well, because we're in Christ. Should we work together? Yes, why? Well, he comforted us with his love. Should we not comfort others and think of others within the assembly? Why should we be like-minded? Well, we have fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit. There are millions of people in this world that probably don't have that. So let's stabilize the relationships that we have now. We have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We have capacity. We're a new spiritual species. We're a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. We don't view man the way that we used to. We look at it from a different perspective now. Before, we're a racist. We judge, color of the skin, all of those things. But now, because we're in Christ, we don't view people like that anymore because if we do, that would create a barrier for being able to communicate the gospel. But because we're in Christ, we, we don't have to. That's point number one. Point number two, well, the first step to unity is to be like-minded. It literally means to think the same thing. Point number three, because we have been loved by God, we ought to love one another. How can we withhold it when he has extended it to us, as well as the person that you don't love? If we're going to be Christ-like, then that would include loving one another. Point number four, we ought to think like Christ thinks. How do we get that? Through the word. We have to take it upon ourselves to open the scripture from 
time to time and have ongoing fellowship with God himself. Point number five, nothing should be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That contributes to disharmony. Instead, point number six, we are, we are to count it to be true that others are better than us. I know some of you are biting your tears saying, what? But if you can get past that, there's going to be harmony. But if you're biting your teeth, more than likely there's no harmony between you and that other person. But if you count it to be true that the other person is better, it's an attitude. It's the mind of Christ. He made himself a little lower than the angel so that he can accommodate us. Why can't we do the same for our brethren? And lastly, you should look out not only for your own interests, as Sarah was pointing out, but also for the interest of others. That'll bring about harmony and unity among any <clears throat> local church. Father, thank you for giving us this passage so that we can have something to study on our own. I'm very thankful, Lord, that we have uh, passed with flying colors for, for the most part. I'm sure that we have some deficiencies. But Lord, even with the deficiencies, you have always been gracious towards us and towards those who are believers in Christ. The words mercy and grace are something that we experience every day that we wake up because you love us. I pray, Lord, that we would just continue to draw from your word. We see and we realize that there are times when people won't always see eye to eye, but instead of trying to prove one thing or the other, if we would consider uh, consider others before ourselves, if we would just recognize the reasons why we should be motivated to live in harmony and unity, as found in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Lord, that should empower us, that should encourage us to uh, do these things so that ultimately you would be pleased. If Paul wrote this for the believers that were undergoing these kind of difficulties, then it applies to us as well. It may not apply today, but it might apply tomorrow. And when the time comes, it would be to our advantage as a child of God, a royal family of God, to make application to the things that we've studied together. So that in the end, when we see you, you would be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you, Father, for this time. We ask as well that you would bless um, the remaining portion of our time together, we have food outside. Again, an expression of your grace and your love. Uh, the provisions are never ending. All we have to do is look around and we would see that just as the lilies are cared for and just as the uh, birds are taken account, uh, are accounted for, you also provide for us. You always take care of our needs. So we thank you for the food. We ask for your blessing upon it. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.